folks, welcome back to my channel. I am so glad that you are here for another fun video. I am Katie and you are watching The Haunted Lighthouse Historian. Today we are doing a very special video for me. Um, we are going to be talking about my favorite Canadian authoress, Miss Lucy Maud Montgomery. So you already knew that from the title of this video, but um, I just want to quickly say a very happy birthday to her. Today is November 30th, 2020, and so she would have been 164 years old if she was still alive. So we're going to... Hey gang, sorry to cut in here. Editor Katie here, but... um. So I saw that I misspoke. Uh, I noted that it was her 164th birthday today, but eh, no, it's her 146th birthday. So wrote the number down, transposed my numbers when I was telling it to you. So I are shamefaced and um, very apologetic to my sweet Maud for messing up her birthday. It's bad enough to get a woman's birthday wrong, but to get it wrong that badly is uh, shameful. So Maud, I love you. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Back to the video. So we're going to be doing a bit of a birthday celebration uh, and talk about 14 little facts about Miss Montgomery that you may or may not have known. Um, but I absolutely love this woman. Um, uh, you know, she created Anna Green Gables. So if you are not familiar with Anna Green Gables, I implore you to please stop this video, stop everything else you're doing um, and go look up this book. Uh, it is quite simply the most magical story I have personally ever read. Uh, I actually started at, with the miniseries that Kevin Sullivan put together back in the 1980s um, with Megan Follows and Jonathan Crombie. Um, it it uh, changed my whole life. And so I saw the movies, loved them, and my mother decided to buy me the book series. So I had the original, um, like, pastel-colored uh, paperback set, and it's still with me. I have it in a box in my attic, which is through this, this door back here. I have no clue what box it's in. Haven't seen it in years because I basically take boxes with me from house to house or apartment to apartment that I've lived in. So uh, some boxes, they've just come with me. I've forgotten what's in them, but the, that set is somewhere and I need to find it because it, it is, you know, my history. But uh, I did actually get a secondary set of the books. And this, this set is very important to me because I picked it up actually on Prince Edward Island in Cavendish at the Green Gables National Park. So this set is the one of the most recent box sets I think that's come out. This one was published back in 2014 and I visited Prince Edward Island in 2015. So a year after this, these were published, they became mine. And so I love the beautiful illustrations on these. Uh, they're kind of like watercolor based. Anne is beautiful in these. She's so sweet. But it's got the entire series, all eight books. So it starts, if you're not familiar with Anna Green Gables, the first book is, of course, called Anna Green Gables. And it is this beautiful little book right here. I love it so much. This is a story about Anne Shirley and her trials and tribulations growing up as an orphan, being shipped off from one house to the next, from one orphanage to the next, um, and finally finding her family with a elderly brother and sister couple who are having trouble um, getting stuff done around their home. And so they decide to adopt a boy to help Matthew, who is the elderly um, male adult, take care of things on his farm. But by some type of provenance, uh, wires get crossed. And so instead of sending a boy, they sent a girl and they sent Anne. And so she charms and worms her little way into the hearts of Matthew and Marilla and finds a home. Finally, you know, after these years and years, she's 11 years old when she finally goes to live with Marilla and Matthew and they create a home together. And it is just such a magical series. I'm, I'm going to cry. I've done this video like four times now because I keep busting out the waterworks. So I got to like reel it back in. But, uh, if you've not read this series, if you've never seen the Kevin Sullivan miniseries, do yourself a favor and read and then watch because I think that you'll absolutely fall in love with it. But uh, like I said, this book series, there's eight of them total. 
So you start with Anne of Green Gables, and then you get Anne of Avonlea, which is this beautiful little book right here. And so you've got Diana and Anne right on the cover there. Diana is her bosomist of bosom friends, um, which is a loving and endearing um, title that you'll learn about. You'll also learn about Kindred Spirits if you read about this book series. Um, Kindred Spirits has been around me my whole life, so I always call my, my dearest friends my Kindred Spirits. And so you get this eight book series, you know, you, you follow Anne's progression from her 11-year-old orphan self up to becoming a woman to um, being such a smart, talented, driving force uh, on this small little Canadian province of Prince Edward Island. So Anne was a creation of Lucy Maud Montgomery, and uh, I owe Lucy Maud Montgomery everything because of this character, I mean. Anne is my favorite. I've got so many dorky little things. Like, I've got my, my book set, um, and it includes, of course, my favorite book in the whole series, which is maybe a... Uh, I don't know, it, this may be an unpopular opinion, but Anne's House of Dreams is my favorite. Favorite, favorite, favorite book of all time. Favorite book of all time. I have read a crap ton of books, and this is my number one. Not Anne of Green Gables, not Anne of Avonlea, not Anne of the Island, which are the three kind of canon main books that a lot of people expect you to, to just kind of focus on. But this book is the best, because you get... Anne's story. It comes full circle. She has the love of her life uh, that you are rooting for the whole time. They, they get together and they're getting married. They get their house of their dreams. Um, right next to, you'll see on the cover, this little lighthouse right here. And another part of the reason why this is my favorite book is because a lighthouse has a major story arc in this. So if you didn't notice my 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 uh, name of my channel, it's the Haunted Lighthouse Historian. So lighthouses are my bag, man. They are my favorite things in the world. And so the fact that I had an Anne book that also incorporates this wonderful story about a lighthouse. We meet Captain Jim, who is the lighthouse keeper. Uh, Anne gets married and she has a kid in this book. And it's just the best. It's the best book ever. So <laughs> you have to read the series. You have to get to book five at least and read Anne's House of Dreams because it is the best. But it does go through the whole series. You get up to Anne's child, Rilla, who is named after Marilla, who is the sister of the brother and sister group that took her in. And so this last book also has a lighthouse on the cover. So, you know, it's got to be good stuff. But Rilla is an um, amazing extension of Anne. And so I, I think that everybody that loves this series uh, also has a wonderful affinity for Rilla as well. But um, I, like I said, I've got all these books in this series that I picked up from Prince Edward Island. I got it at the, the gift shop there uh, at the uh, National Park. And then I've also got my little Anne girl that I picked up at the duty free shop in, coming back from Canada my first time um, kind of going over to Canada by myself. I live in Ohio, so we're about 50 minutes away from Canada um, because I live r basically right on the Michigan-Ohio border. And so it, it doesn't take very long to get to Detroit. And so via Detroit, the Ambassador Bridge, we can get to Canada into Windsor, Ontario very easily. So um, going there the first time on my own, we went to a concert, which is, if you see this poster up here for Anne Berlin, they were playing at a place called Cowboys Ranch. And so it was in, I think, London, Ontario. So we drove up and we went there and on our way back we were going through the duty-free shop and I saw this porcelain doll of Anne and so she is absolutely spectacular I don't know I am not a porcelain doll person they quite frankly freak me out a little bit so if you're freaked out about this I'm very sorry I won't show her very for very long um but something about that doll was just 
I had to have her. She was magical. So she has become another part of my life. I also, uh, I'm not sure if you were a fan of Anne with an E, which was this series that was kind of co-produced by CBC and by Netflix. Uh, and I fell in love with it. Uh, I watched it on CBC because like I said, since I'm so close to Canada here, uh, in Ohio, we were able to get CBC televised. And so I got to see Anne with an E when it was originally actually just called Anne, A-N-N-E. And then when Netflix kind of premiered it, they changed the name of the show to Anne with an E. But uh, another one of my favorite little pieces of memorabilia is this guy right here. It's a little, um, it's called a for your consideration. So the editors and the producers of Anne with an E put this together and uh, would send it out to different people that were voting on like the Emmy Awards and things like that. So it's this cute little book. We've got Amy Beth McNulty right here who plays our wonderful Anne and then it's got this little DVD on the inside. So it contains two episodes of the series and then on the back you've got another little set of photos of the people that created this series. We've got our Gilbert right here and it's just a really cool little keepsake. So uh, I picked it up on eBay I think a while ago and it's one of my favorites but I love Anne. I've even got Raspberry Cordial from when I was on the island. I've got one bottle left from 2015. I'll never drink it because Oh, it's five years old at this point, but uh, I just couldn't, I didn't have the heart to get rid of it. I, uh, I wanted to keep it. So I've got my little four pack box and my raspberry cordial and I can't find any way to import it to the United States. I've tried looking online to see if somebody would import me another four pack of raspberry cordial. I can't do it. I can't figure out what to do, but I miss that very much. It was delicious. But if you have an opportunity to go to Prince Edward Island, guys, oh my God, there are so many things, not just Anne, you know, I mean, Anne is a huge portion of it. And I'm sure the Islanders are like, oh, we got another Anne fan on our hands. Um, but it is a, it is a magical place, truly. Uh, when we drove there, we drove from Ohio to Prince Edward Island and, uh, we, I stepped foot on Prince Edward Island for the first time and you get this magic feeling. It truly is nothing I've ever felt in my life. So if you have an opportunity, definitely add Prince Edward Island to your list. It is beautiful. Uh, the entire, the entire landscape is so unique. I mean, you can be driving down the road and you, you'll be driving right along the coast. So you've got the ocean to your left and you've got this beautiful farmland on your right, or you turn a corner and now you're going down this huge steep hill, um, that takes you into a little town. And now you're in Charlottetown, which is, you know, the city on the island. Um, I mean, there's a couple cities, but really like a big city, uh, Charlottetown is what they have to offer. And it is just extraordinary. So like I said, if you have the opportunity, schedule a trip to Prince Edward Island. So without further ado, um, let us go into these facts about Lucy Maud Montgomery. So happy 164th birth birthday, Maud. Um, I wish you were here to see everything that's going on. I don't know what you would say about it, but uh, I'm sure she would have a lot to write about. So our first little snippet about Lucy Maud Montgomery is that she was born on November 30th, 1874 in Clifton, Prince Edward Island. Now, if you're looking at a map of PEI, you will not find Clifton. They have since renamed it and is now New London. Uh, Maud's mother died when she was two years old and uh, she died of tuberculosis. So when she passed away, she left a very grieving husband who did not know how to care for Maud. And so he decided to um, leave her in the care of her maternal grandparents. So Alexander and Lucy McNeil became her whole world in a very short amount of time. Her father left. He moved to mainland Canada, um, to Saskatchewan area and got a new job and eventually a new wife. So Maude did not have a really great relationship with her father. Um, Alexander and Lucy were basically her whole world. She loved them very, very much. Um, Alexander actually served as the postmaster in 
PEI um, uh, in the Cavendish area. So Maud kind of grew up surrounded by the hustle and bustle of the post office, you know? I mean, back in those days, especially with everything is hinging on the post office, getting things out and getting items back in. So she uh, had a great affinity for the post office. Um, she graduated from high school. She went to college. She got a two-year degree in one year, um, was um, highly praised, and decided to take a job teaching. So she worked actually in three different locations before her grandfather passed away. So grandpa passed away, and so she decided that she was going to leave her position as a teacher and move back in with her grandmother to take care of her and to also work as an assistant postmaster. So I think this was a bit of a blessing in disguise for Maude because in doing this, she now had this amazing ability to kind of be anonymous and um, send out her work. She had said later in life that she may never have had this, the, um, the strength to put her work out to see if it would get published because she did not want the ridicule, the gossip of people in town finding out that she wrote this manuscript and it had been rejected. So in working at the post office, she could submit her work uh, and nobody knew what she was doing. So if it came back and it was rejected, only Maude knew about it. So I think that that gave her this amazing ability to um, kind of have the strength to do that. Because like she said, she may never have submitted Anna Green Gables to be published. And what a world that would be if we were never given Anne of Green Gables. So I always thought that was an amazing little story. But she was rejected many, many times uh, in 1905 when she first sent out the publication. Um, and so she got very disheartened, obviously, and decided to shelve the story, put it in a hat box, put it away in her closet for two years. Did not revisit it again. Two years later, in 1907, she decides to give it another read, fell in love with her character again, and wanted still for people to read this story. So she got up the courage and decided to resubmit it again. And so she sent it throughout Canada and she sent it down to the United States um, to many publishing companies there and one in Boston bit the page. So once the page company said, yes, we're going to publish this book in 1908, um, it was sent out and well received many places over. Um, today, if you're looking at numbers, we know that it's been translated into 36 different languages, which is just astounding if you think about it. Um, a lot of books that get published today, you know, we're, they're lucky if they get translated into 10 languages. Um, so Anne has seen many different locations and been loved by millions of people. 50 million copies of Anna Green Gables have been sold. That's just Anna Green Gables. We're not talking about the rest of the series. So, I mean, that's absolutely astounding, but it's been translated into Albanian and Croatian and uh, Hungarian and Romanian and Czech and Slovak and Swedish. And one country in particular has found such a loving affinity for Anne, uh, and that is the country of Japan. So if you are not familiar, uh, J the Japanese um, decided to translate the story, but it was translated back during the World Wars, where, you know, C Canada and the English language was, we were enemies to the, J the Japanese, but... Um, one person in particular found such a loving affinity for Anne and wanted her story to be translated so that her friends and family could love her as well. And so she did. She kind of, uh, under the radar, translated this story and uh, it was published and it is so well loved. The Japanese people are absolutely extraordinary. They have... Uh, you know, when I was reading guidebooks before we left to take our trip to Prince Edward Island, so many of the books said, you know, be prepared to see a lot of Japanese tourists because they absolutely love the Anne girl. And they were not wrong. We showed up to the uh, Green Gables Historical uh, National Park and there was a whole tour bus of Japanese women that piled out of this bus to go see the Green Gables National Historical Site. And 
they were so happy. They were so thrilled to be there. You know, I felt like these women were my kindred spirits and I, I didn't know anything about them other than that they fell in love with this story. They loved this little red haired girl so much. And so uh, I felt a very big kinship to these women. And uh, I was just absolutely delighted watching them laugh and talk in Japanese. I mean, they, they were speaking, of course, their language and I had no idea what they were saying. All I knew was that they were as thrilled as I was to be there. And so it was, it was a very magical moment to kind of experience that with these women. So it was my first time there. Obviously it was their first time there. And, uh, we all absolutely adored our time on Prince Edward Island. I, there's no doubt in my mind that those women had their whole lives change, um, the time that they were there. So it was, it was incredible. So when the page company was getting ready to submit, you know, the, the publication for people to start picking up a copy, they, uh, of course, just like today, would have other authors read the work and then write a little blurb about the story. So one very uh, impressive uh, little blurb came from Samuel Clemens. And if you're not familiar with the name Samuel Clemens, you may be more familiar with his pen name, Mark Twain. So Mark Twain, who gave us Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, he gave us these amazing adventures with these two young boys fell in love with Anne. Uh, and I want to make sure that I quote this correctly. So he said to one of his publishers, um, he said, Anne of Green Gables is the dearest, most moving and delightful child since the immortal Alice. So you've got to see the high praise in the fact that he fell so in love with Anne that he would, you know, akin her to Alice from Alice in Wonderland. I mean, that is high praise indeed. I personally have never fallen down the rabbit hole literally with Alice. I've never read those books. I watched the miniseries when I was a kid um, that had like Stocker Channing in it, or not Stocker Channing, um, Carol Channing in it and uh, loved that. But I never read, I never read this, the book series. So that's on me. I definitely need to, to get on the level and read those amazing Lewis Carroll stories. But uh, eventually I will. But um, suffice it to say, that is high praise. And it was published in pages. Um, they kind of had like a, a, a publisher list. And then it got sent to The Sun in New York. Um, and they published that on November 21st, 1908. So Anne kind of came right out of the gate with this beautiful high praise. Um, Maud had a great love for nature. Um, and I think that you can really feel that when you read Anna Green Gables, her attention to the details, her love for the little nuances of the seasons of the time of year. You know, she would note the coloration of the leaves and she would talk about the, the tinge of the sky. And she would talk about these beautiful trees like they were all her friend. And she really had a love and an affinity for a specific birch tree. So in one of her poems, she actually wrote about this tree and the poem was called the monarch of the forest and so a little blurb from it is around the poplar and the spruce the fir and maple st stood but the old tree that i loved best grew in the haunted wood and so she even takes that little part of the haunted wood turns that into her story um with anna green gables so we get a little piece of the haunted wood there which i always thought was wonderful but she wrote 20 books in her lifetime. So 19 of those books were about her beloved Prince Edward Island. One book was actually written about Ontario, which is where she kind of picked up and moved after she uh, gets married. And so this book, The Blue Castle, um, kind of goes over Muskoka, Ontario, which is where she kind of, one of the areas where she kind of re, um, revisited time and time again in Ontario with her husband. Um, but she also lived in Leeskdale, Norville, and Toronto while she was in Ontario. So really within six hours, I could get to where Maud ended up living, which is just insane to me. Like I think about that all the time. Like I could, I could take a day and go up and visit Maud's location if I had my passport up to date, but I don't 
because I got remarried and so my last name changed so I've got to get that updated but that's like the top of my list once that passport is back up and running I want to definitely check out where Maud lived out the rest of her life um so she actually got married to a reverend reverend ewan mcdonald um and so they got married in july of 1911 and when i was in prince edward island i actually got to go to the uh the green gables museum which is actually where she kind of grew up uh her her family lived there and so the Lake of Shining Waters, where she got the idea for that, was located on the property where she and Ewan got married. They got married right in front of a fireplace in the living room there. So I got to see where she got married. I got to see the bookshelf that she would look at and see the reflection of herself in it. That's where she got the idea to write about Katie Maurice because Katie Maurice was her own imaginary friend that she grew up with. So it was just such an amazing time in my life. 2015 was my year, man. We we got to go up to Prince Edward Island and then we drove back and drove along the coast. We went to Salem, Massachusetts. We went to Sleepy Hollow, New York. It was such an incredible trip for me and my bosom friend, Nicole. And uh, I suggest anybody that has the opportunity to take a week, 10 days, whatever you can get, and uh, make a trip like that, you should do it. And if you have the ability to drive, definitely do that. Because we had kind of played around with the ideas of just flying to PEI or, you know, flying to Maine and then taking like a rental car. But we decided we were going to just drive the whole way. And it was a lot of driving, but it was so worth it. We saw so many amazing things. We went through the Adirondacks and we got to go up into Vermont. We went over Lake Champlain. Uh, it was, it was amazing. And then, oh my gosh, the whole coast of Maine is worth it just to drive down that. It was incredible. So I'm digressing again. I'm sorry, but, um, definitely, you should definitely take the trip. And, um, so throughout Maud's life, she kept a very detailed diary that kind of went over, you know, um, her schooling, um, graduating, her marriage, her, um, the death of her son that she endured, um, the war, the haunting things happening during World War I. Um, all of this was kind of put into her diary and uh, it's been, you know, kind of circulated and you can read all of her entries, which I think is just amazing. Um, but it also deals with like her, her health. And like I said, she had three boys. Um, one was stillborn. So she had uh, Stuart and she had Chester and then Hugh was stillborn. So in 1935, she was named an officer of the Order of the British Empire. Um, I think maybe the only woman to be put in at the time. I think since, of course, that's changed. But I think at the time, she was like the only woman to be a part of this very elite group. And I just think that's absolutely incredible. I mean, she's an incredible woman, regardless of her title or whatever. But she, uh, that's a very high honor that was bestowed upon her. Um, she is well loved globally and she truly loved her wonderful home on Prince Edward Island. So like I said, she and her husband, Ewan, they moved to Ontario. Um, she, you know, kind of had to follow him because he was a reverend. So he was getting stationed at different locations. And so, um, when she died though, she wanted to be laid to rest on Prince Edward Island. So she is in the Cavendish Cemetery. So if you go to Prince Edward Island, you can see her gravestone. Um, Ewan was actually interred with her. Uh, he died the year after she passed away. She died in 1942. He followed in 1943. So they are buried on the island and she is right next to her mother and her maternal grandparents, which I think is just wonderful because right down the road, is where she grew up. I mean, you could just, you can get out of the cemetery, you take a right, and then you take another right, and that's basically where she grew up. It's, it's insane. It, it was, it was incredible. Um, so she passed away on April 24th, 1942, um, and she died at home in her sleep. There are many things kind of circling around her death. Some people 
she never had an autopsy. So there isn't really one specific reasoning for her death. Her family has come out over the years. Uh, on the 100th anniversary, her great-great-granddaughter um, kind of said that they think that she committed suicide because she was riddled with depression and mental illness. Um, I think like a lot of people are. I mean, we don't really talk about it very much, but it's not like these are new things. People have been depressed. People have been anxiety-ridden for centuries. And so um, they, they think that maybe inadvertently um, she may have um, either overdosed, um, she was taking barbiturates and um, bromides, um, which are kind of pills that she was taking for her depression and for her anxiety and things like that. Her husband also suffered from depression as well. So they were both taking these pills. And you know, back in the day, they didn't realize how addicting these pills were. So it was almost like, you know, she had no idea what she, what was going on. Um, she was taking something prescribed to her from her doctor that she thought was supposed to be making her feel better. So, uh, it, it is absolutely tragic. And, um, regardless of how it happened, if she overdosed, if she, took too many because she didn't want to deal with the pain she was dealing with anymore. We, we don't know. All we do know is that she passed away. She was 67 years old. Um, but she provided so much joy to so many people. And I think that regardless of how it ended, we should always celebrate her incredible life because she has provided so much love and joy for many many people, not just women, many men can, you know, attribute, um, their love for, um, you know, nature and history and courage and strength from that plucky little redhead girl that, you know, uh, changed her stars because she, she wasn't going to back down on how she felt. And, um, she cast a spell on everybody, she, everybody that she met. So Marilla and Matthew were not the only two to fall under the spell of Anne Shirley. So I think that all has to do with the great creator. You know, L.M. Montgomery gave us Anne Shirley. And uh, I will forever be indebted to her for that incredible part of my life. She has been with me practically my whole life. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I, I saw the, the miniseries when I was very young. You know, I think it came out in 1985 or 86. And I was born in 1983. So I was very young when it came on the scene, but I watched it when it would show on Disney Channel or our local PBS station and uh, fell so hard in love with this story. I fell in love with Megan Follows and her spunky ass little redheaded characterization of Anne. Uh, I fell in love with Gilbert Blythe. Jonathan Crombie was absolutely incredible. And I fell in love with Marilla and Matthew and Diana and Mrs. Lynde and all of these incredible characters that have since gone on to kind of shape who I've become. I mean, I am a redhead because of Anne Shirley. She made being a redhead a cool thing, man. She and Lucille Ball and Winifred Sanderson were the three people uh, I so looked up to as a kid that I wanted to emulate and be. And all three of them were redheads. So I'm, I'm working my way up to becoming more like Anne, more like Lucille Ball and being just some sassy as hell like Winifred Sanderson was. So that is my uh, my little chat about Lucy, uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery. So I hope that uh, I didn't talk your ear off completely. I hope you enjoyed this little history lesson about this absolutely incredible woman who I will never, ever forget, who I will celebrate every single year. Even if she's not here to have cake and ice cream, I will still uh, celebrate her birthday 
and uh, sing her praises forever. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a like. Uh, any comments or suggestions, put them down below. I love to read them. I love to interact with you guys. Uh, and if you want to subscribe, I'd love it. Uh, I, like I said, I don't post about the same things all the time. I like to get new content out. Uh, in October, I posted every day. I did a 31 days of Vlogtober and I posted about my favorite horror movies and um, like ghost stories and things like that. I love lighthouses, obviously. That's my, my name is the Haunted Lighthouse Historian. So most of my stuff um, is going to pretty much cater around lighthouses. But this channel is also pretty new. I just started back in August of 2020. So uh, we're, I'm up for suggestions. I'm up for if you have some ideas or if you want me to kind of delve into some things and give some research history about a topic, I'd be happy to do it. So, uh, I'm going to sign off here again. If you like it, like, subscribe, all that stuff I'm supposed to say at the end, which feels weird, but you know, it's necessary for me to get my channel out to maybe some other Ellen Montgomery fans. So I will talk to all your lovely faces in my next video.